I'm hopefully, John, I'm getting your last name right. It's, um, it's John Kalabokadis. Did I get that right? Pretty good. Excellent. Um, is a research biologist and one of the founders of the um, Cascadia Research of Cascadia Research, a non-profit research organization formed in 1979, based in Olympia, Washington. Not a very pretty place. Uh, he periodically uh, serves as adjunct faculty at the Evergreen State College, teaching a course on marine mammals. His primary interests are the biology of marine mammals and the impacts of humans. Um, as the senior research biologist at Cascadia uh, Research, he has say, set, served as project director of over 100 projects. He has authored two books on marine mammals, um, the award-winning Guide to Marine Mammals of Greater Puget Sound um, from Island Publishers, uh, with R. Osborne and E. M. Dorsey, and Blue Whales from Voyager Press with C. G. H. Steiger, as well as more than 150 publications in scientific journals and technical sport, uh, reports. And I was looking some of that up. I was looking at your bio today, and it's like 27 pages long. Um, so a lot, a lot of work, very, very, very prolific. Um, he has conducted studies on a variety of marine mammals in the North Pacific, um, from Central America to Alaska. Is directed long-term research on the st status, movements, and underwater behaviors of blue, humpback, and gray whales. His work has been covered on shows by Discovery Channel and others, and has been featured in National Geographic TV specials and a magazine article in 2009. Um, so please enjoy the um, our speaker tonight. And um, John, I'm going to turn it over to you. see so many people here in a great spot that we uh, have here. I typically launch just up the one channel there at the boat launch and was out just uh, last month uh, here we had a few more blue and thin whales on the channel and I'll show you a couple of results that we got earlier this year. Uh, raise your hand if you're part of the Channel Islands Naturalist so the people raising their hands here are people that go out on some of the whale watch boats uh, and take data and take photographs that end up coming to us. And some of the results I'll be showing you tonight uh, kind of come as a product of that work. So first I wanted to start out by thanking all of you uh, that do that. That's really been helpful to us. It's a key part of our research for a long time. Uh, we relied solely on our dedicated small boat surveys that would go out looking for whales and more and more uh, those kinds of opportunistic uh, sightings and identification photographs that played a key role in our research. Uh, so I really appreciate that. Uh, you'll notice a couple of minor edits to the title from what was uh, you, what you might have seen listed. I did the. Uh, yeah, I did sneak in Finn and gray whales into the title word. I think you'd notice it just said uh, humpback and blue whales before because uh, I thought it'd be fun to cover that. I put gray whales at the end, and depending on how, how time goes, they may get short thrift, but I for sure wanted to talk a little bit about fin whales as well. Now, our research, uh, I started studying the large whales in the mid-1980s. That's when uh, my research began. We actually started a project in 1986 in the Gulf of the Farallones off San Francisco Bay. Uh, there was this new, newly formed national marine sanctuaries that were being set up along the West Coast. And the Gulf of the Farallones sanctuary off San Francisco was uh, one of the first of those that uh, actually brought us in to try to learn something about the large whales that were present in the sanctuary and to understand you know, what species, where did they come from, how were they doing. And we started initially focused on humpback whales. Uh, we later expanded to blue whales very quickly because we were encountering them. In the What's interesting is that with the number of things that we've done for a long time, like the photo identification of individual animals has been a key part of our research from the inception. And then we have new technologies that have become available that have opened up new insights into the research. So uh, tags that let us gather data on what the whales are doing underwater and get video uh, on their behavior and their feeding, uh, using acoustic recorders to record their vocalizations, using drones to look at behavior and sizes. 
So these are, uh, it's been an exciting development both to use some of these long-term uh, you know, methods like photo ID that build up and give us more information over time, but also seeing some of the new developments that have come along uh, that, that kind of open up areas of research I hadn't imagined possible before. Largely, we focused on some very basic questions. You know, starting out, really, our goal was to identify you know, what was the abundance of these populations, how were they doing, what were their trends, uh, what sort of threats were they facing. Uh, something that might not be obvious, but uh, a really key part also is understanding their population structure. That's how are they organized. When we have blue whales that feed off California here, what population are they a part of? How far do they range? Because really these animals cover huge distances. And if we want to understand their populations and uh, the threats they face, we really have to understand where they're moving between and what are these units that we're trying to protect. Uh, increasingly, my research in the last 10 years have focused more and more on different types of human threats. And so I'm going to go through talking a little bit about each species, and then I'm going to go start talking a little bit about some of the threats and the ways we've tried to look at them and bring in uh, some of you who have, like, raise your hand if you've seen one of my talks before. That's going to be, yeah, I see quite a few people have seen talks. So some of you'll see some of the material we've had and then uh, I've had in past talks and then uh, uh, I'll also be presenting some things that no one else has seen yet because I was just working on them today. Uh, so things from this year. Um, okay. So I mentioned this photo identification, you know, so this is like tracking individual animals by their natural markings with humpback whales, it's the underside of the fluke. With blue whales, it's pigment patterns on the side of the animal. With fin whales, it's the shape of, or, of the dorsal fin and nicks and notches on the dorsal fin. On the gray whale, it's some of the coloration and scarring and the positioning of the hump and, not, and the knuckles that let us track individual animals. But just to give you a sense of how this has built up over the years, for humpback whales, we started our work in 1986, but we have some identifications that go back to 1980 and earlier that people gathered before we started our research. We now have over 4,500 different individuals that we've identified along just the U.S. West Coast. Now, I'm going to mention a project where we looked at humpback whales across the North Pacific, and that involved many more individuals. But just along the West Coast, we've identified, you know, now close to 5,000 animals. You see the greater than rather than the exact number. I was hoping to fill in an exact number today <laughs> because I've been working and on the phone with my office all day because we're just updating our catalogs and database from 2017 from last year. Uh, and they didn't quite get it finished. So I know it's over 4,500 individuals. And we have, when I say sightings IDs, that's how many records do we have where an individual was identified and tracked. And we have over 36,000 cases where a known individual was identified and tracked. So the database has gotten pretty extensive. Uh, and just our most recent round, we've added close to 10,000 of these records. Uh, with gray whales and with blue whales, the numbers are a little smaller, but still well over 10,000 identifications, several thousand unique individuals that we track. The gray whales, the one thing I qualify that as, we don't try to track the whole gray whale population. When I introduce gray whales, I'll talk about how there's over 20,000 gray whales that uh, migrate in the eastern North Pacific. We focused on those animals that tend to feed and stay along the uh, Pacific Northwest and the U.S. West Coast and feed. Uh, so that's a, a smaller number and why our catalog is so much smaller than the population overall. Now, I'll start out talking about humpback whales and a little background and let, kind of let you know some of the things that we're up to with humpback whales. First of all, just to get a picture, this was a map for the International Whaling Commission, uh, which Despite its name, the International Whaling Commission is now a body that plays a major role in whale conservation because there's been a moratorium on the commercial exploitation of whales for quite a few years now. And you have a few countries that exploit various loopholes in that moratorium. But by and large, the International Whaling Commission, most of its actions now are related to conservation. So they're trying to do a new assessment of humpback whales and their status in the North Pacific. So for this, uh, this actually shows their little circles on that map. 
those show the locations that commercial whalers kill a humpback whale. Uh, and this is going back almost 100 years. And you can see they were extensively hunted, especially in Alaskan waters, uh, throughout the Gulf of Alaska, Aleutians into the Bering Sea, and along the U.S. West Coast. And you'll see a little cluster. So if you come down here, you'll actually see quite an interesting cluster right here. And that's a lot of the animals that uh, were taken out of whaling stations in areas like San Francisco Bay. We actually had whaling stations that hunted humpback whales on the U.S. West Coast through 1966, which is when the hunting of humpback whales was banned. But we had two whaling stations operating in San Francisco Bay that killed uh, you know, well over a thousand humpback whales in the Gulf of the Fairlands. Now, you can't tell this, but mixed in here are some squares, and they actually represent all the locations that we got identifications of humpback whales as part of a project we called Splash in the mid-2000s. And it actually overlaps with some of the areas where the whaling occurred. But we don't have to belabor that point, other than the key point that humpbacks feed all the way along the U.S. West Coast. You'll see throughout this eastern and central North Pacific, and I just, I, I, I didn't want to make the map too small, but it continues all the way over here to Russia, uh, the Kamchatka Peninsula. So those are all the feeding areas of humpback whales. Now in this splash study, we looked extensively at how these, where these humpback whales then migrated to, to breed in winter. And so these lines connect the recitings of an identified individual between where it was seen feeding and where it was seen on the breeding ground. And the main take-home message here is just a couple of points. Main breeding grounds for humpback whales, especially those that feed along the U.S. West Coast, are Central America and mainland Mexico. So there's are in blue and red, and you can see most of these lines coming up from Central America, and in blue here from Mexico, are actually coming up here to the U.S. West Coast. So most of the humpback whales we have here and uh, are coming from those breeding grounds. We have quite a few humpback whales that breed in Mexico, these dispersed widely from British Columbia all the way around to the Aleutians and even somewhat to the Russia, uh, areas off Russia. You have some western breeding grounds for humpback whales, you know, from the Philippines up to these islands south of Japan, off Okinawa and Ogasawara. And those animals primarily go up here to feeding areas in the eastern North Pacific, but you can see some make these cross-Pacific migrations. And in fact, we had one animal that wasn't part of the splash study, so it's not on this figure, but we published a paper on it uh, that had been seen here in Okasawara that actually came over here to Washington and British Columbia. So its main movement was across the Pacific. And you know, some of these migrations are you know, some of the longest migrations of uh, you know, any animal crossing the Pacific like that. But it rivals gray whales, which depending on how you measure mileage are, are the other real long distance record holders in terms of long migrations. Now partly as a result of some of this work now, uh, there's been a new uh, designation for humpback whales under the Endangered Species Act. In the past, humpback whales were just considered kind of one unit globally. And uh, just a few years ago, uh, partly as a result of some of the research we and other people have been doing, uh, they started to recognize the fact that there were many of these distinct populations. And in fact, they recognized 14 of them that were called distinct population segments, or DPSs. And relevant to us in the North Pacific, Central America was considered a distinct population segment. Mexico, Hawaii, and then over here in the Western North Pacific there were four distinct population segments recognized. And that means each of those could have a different status under the endangered species. And so we have a rather bizarre situation that's developed because based on the population size and trends, Central America was considered endangered, Mexico was considered threatened, and Hawaii was considered delisted and not threatened or endangered. Now that creates kind of an awkwardness for us on the West Coast because we primarily work with them when they're on their feeding areas where they're spending most of their time. But that means out here along the West Coast, we have humpback whales that are endangered, humpback whales that are threatened, and humpback whales that are not threatened or endangered depending on where they happen to have come from. So even though I think this represented an improvement 
in the sense that it recognized the fact humpback whales have these distinct groups. Um, it also created a lot of confusion. <laughs> uh, and so some of the research we're engaged in now, it, it did actually create a little opening. We are doing more humpback whale research this year than we have in 10 years, partly because now there are these increased threats to humpback whales, and there's a real need to know more about which populations these animals represent that are being affected. And I'll show you some of those threats in a second. You know, when you look at the kind of, uh, this is from a paper we did about three years ago, looking at what were the highest density and most important areas for humpback whales. We call them biologically important feeding areas. It was part of a push by NOAA to kind of identify key areas for humpback whales. And we both looked at where we had sighted and tracked humpback whales, but we also joined us with an effort by NOAA that was trying to develop these models based on habitat features, water depth, oceanographic conditions, that said where are humpback whales most abundant. And you can see those are color-coded by density. So red, black dots show where we sighted humpback whales. Red shows where the model showed the highest density. And the key thing that I want to draw your attention to is this lower right box here. And you'll see that the Santa Barbara Channel and the area really just off of here is one of the areas that was considered a biologically important area for humpback whales. You can see lots of black dots in here, or you may not be able to see it, but and you'll also see there's a red color in here, and we have one of these biologically important areas marked. So this area does have a special significance in that as a result of the research that's been going on that some of you have participated in. It's now recognized as a biologically important area for humpback whales along the west coast. A lot of the other areas are up here from Monterey Bay up through the Gulf of the Farallones off San Francisco. Uh, so that's another high density area. You can see the coloration is red, there are lots of black dots, and there's a circled area showing that's a designated area. So that's kind of the main point I want to make from that slide. Now I was talking about how where humpback whales go actually varies by where you are on the coast. I'm about to update this figure with the new data that hopefully will be completed tomorrow. But uh, this still tells a pretty interesting story. Here you see a map of the west coast from Southern California up to Washington. And then these bars over here match up with the map. And the main thing I want to show you is this first column is the proportion of animals in each of these areas along the coast that we know came from the Central America breeding ground, in this case, or the Southern Mexico, or mainland Mexico, or over here on the right, Hawaii. And the main story that this tells is that you'll see the biggest bars are down here for Central America, are down here off Southern California. And what this really revealed is that, uh, especially here in Southern California, we have the highest proportion of these endangered uh, humpback whales that breed in Central America. So this is a particularly critical area and will have added importance in terms of concern about entanglements or ship strikes or other threats uh, under at least the Endangered Species Act. You'll see a little different pattern for mainland Mexico. That tends to peak here off central and northern Mexico. If you look at the pattern for Hawaii, it's increasing proportions of animals from Hawaii as you go north. And that only increases as you go further north by the time you get to southeast Alaska. And the vast majority of those humpbacks are then coming from the Hawaii region. Now, overall, the trajectory of how these populations have been changing for humpback whales has been a, a pretty interesting story. When we started our work in the mid-1980s, and these estimates go back to about 1990, you'll see over the next 20 years, we documented a consistent increase of about 7 to 8 percent per year in humpback whale abundance. In that change, sometime around 2010, uh, those estimates of population leveled off. And I'm not going to belabor, but you see three different lines here. And these are the result of three different ways to model mathematically and estimate abundance based on those photo IDs and what are called mark recapture. So how often do you see the same animals versus encounter new animals? And uh, this higher bar right here, which shows a current estimate of just under 2,500 humpback whales uh, off California and Oregon that feed, 
is probably the most accurate. It's just one that I have to use about four to five years of data pooled together. So it doesn't quite have the level of sensitivity, but it accounts for some biases that aren't accounted for in these models. Uh, the most detailed model here is a model I can estimate an abundance from two years of data. It shows a little more noise, but it also shows this increase that then levels off uh, in the last five years. So, so this is kind of exciting. We've seen what looks like um, humpback whales potentially having recovered back to maybe what the marine environment can support. Now what's tricky about this is in the same period, this last five, ten years, is when we've seen increased mortality of humpback whales. And it's created a little bit of a, a chicken and egg dilemma, which is, is that population <coughs> reaching larger numbers? And there's some interesting things that happen because of that then cause humpback whales to be more exposed to different human threats? Or are we seeing potentially the effect of those added human threats that's maybe keeping that population from recovering? So uh, we're pretty sure it's the first of those, that this population has recovered to levels that look like is similar to what we think was here prior to commercial whaling. It took a while to happen because commercial whaling continued through 1966, so it took a little while for these long-lived animals to recover, but we think they have. But we do think that that recovery and the expansion into new areas has put them more in conflict with some of the human activities I'll mention. Uh, one of the things that we've seen in that same time period where that population has leveled off is increasing numbers of humpback whales showing up in some areas that we didn't typically see them. And you can see I have an arrow down here off Southern California because we're much more commonly, it used to be that we would see humpback whales primarily in the Santa Barbara Channel and off the Northern Channel Islands, but not too much south of there other than an occasional migrating animal. And now we're much more regularly seeing humpback whales. You know, and if you go out on whale watch boats, you're likely to see them right now out of even places like, you know, Oceanside or Newport Beach. Uh, humpback whales are the dominant large whale species they're seeing right now. Uh, and that's further south than is typical. Most dramatically up north up here, the Salish Sea, that includes the Strait of Juan de Fuca, Puget Sound, uh, an area where we're based. And we've seen a huge influx of humpback whales coming into the inside waters of Washington State. And I'll show you just a little bit of data on that. For example, these are sightings of humpback whales in the Salish Sea. So that's Strait of Juan de Fuca and Puget Sound by year. And you'll see very low numbers we, in the 1990s to 2000s we saw very few and then in the late 2000s we suddenly saw this huge increase in sighting reports that generally kept going up and uh, so much so that now these animals have become it used to be whale watching in the san juan islands was solely focused on the southern resident killer whales and now we see quite a few whale watch boats specifically going out for humpback whales because they're regularly now in inside water. And that also has had a consequence. Just in the last week, we've had two humpback whales get entangled in Jones in the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Uh, and two of them occurred in adjacent bays. So uh, we are seeing, as they kind of return to some of these areas, they are getting more exposed uh, to some of these human activities that they weren't before. You know, one of the things that's been exciting, uh, even though photo ID is our sort of old technique, we are increasingly able to use some new technologies that are helping us. Um, all right, how many of you are familiar with Happy Whale? Well, for example, there's a website now, Happy Whale, it's set up by a guy named Ted Cheeseman, where you can enter your humpback whale photograph, and it will try to match it and come up with records of recitings of that whale. Uh, so it's a site that uh, we supported, so we actually provided our catalog of identification photographs for that site and some of our records of IDs. Uh, we also work with another group that Happy Whale is also reliant on, a group called Wildbook, that has been developing these automated matching algorithms that make things like that possible. And so we were excited in that uh, we tested some of these algorithms, and over the last 30 years, I don't know how many person years of time we've put in matching photographs. And as our catalogs get bigger, we spend more and more time. Like right now, 
if by hand you have to match a, a humpback whale photograph to our catalog. And even though we categorize it by white, in, unless it's a whale that you know you happen to stumble into early on, you can spend two to three hours trying to find that one whale looking through the catalog by hand. And these automated algorithms can dramatically speed that up, such that what would take us two or three person years, once we organize all the photographs and get it to them, we get the results the next day. <laughs> so something that took years can take a couple of hours of running it through these algorithms. And, and some of the matches they found are, are pretty interesting. You know, these are three photographs of the same whale. And you know, you can pick up some of the subtle markings that are the same, but you can see this would be quite challenging. There's some new scars here that were developed and the algorithm was able to detect with the trailing edge. And the algorithm uses two different things, a pattern recognition, but it also uses the very subtle little ridges and bumps along this trailing edge uh, to recognize that. And just to show you another example, here's a whale that went through actually quite a few changes. It got a major notch taken out of it. Uh, you don't see many markings. It has some new scars here, not visible here. But this is the same whale. And this was an example of one that our hand matchers missed and the algorithm found. Uh, so so there, there's some exciting developments uh, in that that are speeding up some of that data. Uh, this year is actually going to be a real watershed year for us to come back whales. So uh, there is a survey going on right now. NOAA uh, does these ship surveys about every five years where they survey the whole U.S. West Coast and they do line transect surveys searching for all the large whale species. And what they're measuring is density. And usually their lines go far offshore. But this year they were, con they were constrained in the first four months to do these coastal lines because they were doing the surveys in association with a fish survey. Uh, so they only had half the personnel that could use different lines and it meant they couldn't break off transect and verify sightings or try to get IDs or do some of the things they would normally try to do. Uh, so they ended up working with us and now we have a small boat that's paralleling them down the coast working from shore and taking advantage of all of the sightings they get from these very nice, tightly spaced lines. Uh, and we then follow them up to get both, you know, ID samples, tag deployments, you know, skin samples. And that's gone really well. We're about halfway through that. Right now the ship is right here. Uh, and so far, just on this leg up here, we've gotten over 500 identifications of humpback whales, 150 samples collected. They'll be down here in our area in early September. So I'll be, I'll be back here, for example, on about 8 or 9 September. And that's when the ship will be surveying here. And we'll be following up their sightings. To get ideas. So this, this is probably going to be our most dramatic improvement in our assessment of humpback whales along the West Coast. We've never had this level of thoroughness of coverage. So I'm excited about what's happening this year. And largest so, of all the whales. Uh, they're the other species we started studying in the mid-1980s. Uh, this is actually just west of Catalina Island. Uh, this is one of our rigid hull inflatables. That's me here driving. We're actually approaching this blue whale uh, to deploy a tag that's on the end of this pole right here. And this is our big boat. This is our 24 foot boat. Uh, and this is actually a relatively small blue whale. Uh, but still you can get an appreciation of the size uh, from the air. We had a, one of these uh, swordfish fish spotters that was flying over us and uh, uh, took this photograph and sent it to us. We usually don't get this kind of perspective on our work. And you know, blue whales still remain kind of one of my favorite species. Uh, this is something Dale Rice, a researcher from the 50s and 60s, wrote back in 1964 or something like that. Uh, and I just thought it was very appropriate. There's no whaler uh, and no whale biologist, no matter how experienced, who is so jaded that his heart does not race at the sight of a blue whale. And I still sort of feel that way uh, in the world. Uh, you know, I showed you what the trend was with humpback whales. Here's that tr upward trend in humpback whales. But here's the trends with blue whales. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this other than to show you that blue whale numbers have not been increasing. Uh, uh, 
We were very concerned about that, whether that was a result of some of the threats they're facing. The other possibility is that their populations had already recovered. Uh, and we're still a little unsure on what that is. Uh, and there's a little bit of a disturbing aspect to it. These are the estimates from those ship surveys that I mentioned that NOAA does. And you can see in the 1990s, they regularly got estimates of about 2,500 blue whales. But then in the 2000s through 2014, their estimates have been more in the 1,000 to 1,500 range. So right now, our estimates based on identified individuals are suggesting the population is stable. But it looks like the estimates based on how many are generally present at any moment in time, which is what these estimates come up with, have actually shown that blue whales are spending less time along the California, Oregon, Washington coast. And we think that's mostly because they're spending more time up into the Gulf of Alaska and off of the west coast of Baja. But still, it's a somewhat troubling overall pattern. You know, if you're used to going out on boats here in the Santa Barbara Channel, you'll see sometimes not many blue whales, and then there'll be large numbers of blue whales, and then not many. But what we're seeing isn't generally very representative of what the population is doing. This is more our estimates of what that whole population is doing. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about blue whales is we were, we've been finding that humpback whales are very loyal to special, specific areas, but blue whales are just much more mobile in that. And that mobility is kind of shown. Not only do they move down to breeding areas off Central America, but also their feeding areas range all the way from the Gulf of Alaska all the way down to Baja, California, all these areas in yellow. And I'm not going to get into what these numbers mean. They just show kind of how many individuals we've identified and the fact that we see a lot of movements of blue whales among all of these areas. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit, I, this is going to be a little funny order because I'm going to talk about tagging for a second and then I'm going to come back to fin whales because most of what I'm going to talk about is a little bit about some of the recent fin whale deployments. So I'm just going to talk about for a second some of the tags we deploy. We have a variety of tag types that different researchers use. And I just mostly put this up here because uh, if you hear someone's tagging whales, that can mean very different things. We have focused on more short-term tags that we generally attach with either a suction cup or a very short darts if we want to get a week or two deployment. But there are also tags uh, that other researchers deploy that can more implant into the muscle of the whale and stay on for a month, uh, for sometimes a year or more. And, and the difference between those tags is these tags up here, these shorter term tags, are tags you deploy and recover. And that means you can store a tremendous amount of data on them. You can gather video, you can gather acoustics. Uh, we have an accelerometer that samples 400 times a second that lets us recreate all of the movements of the whale underwater. Whereas longer term tags, that you don't recover can only transmit a small amount of information to a satellite. So, so the trade-off you have between these tags is short-term tags that give you a huge amount of data at very little impact to the whale, but only for very short periods of time, versus longer-term tags that are more invasive, give you less data, but can do it over long periods of time. So in reality, these two types, these different types of approaches can complement each other. Uh, but to me, you also have to weigh that impact to the animal piece. And we primarily use these tags, you know, to look at underwater behavior, nighttime movements and behavior, calling behavior, the vocalizations of blue whales, uh, how do they interact with ships, and how do they respond to underwater sound. And those are all active projects we have going. Uh, these are some examples of of these different types of tags that I won't belabor right now. I'll show you these are the types of tags that we most recently deploy. And these are ones that do have these short darts uh, that attach. They don't go deeper than the skin and blubber layer. Uh, but they are still an invasive tag. And these are the tags we'll get, you know, one to three weeks of data on. One of these tags, like this configuration right here, uh, costs about $30,000. And you know this unit right here is the main data unit. That's about fifteen thousand dollars. Here's a GPS unit. That's about four thousand dollars. Here's a satellite transmitter to help us locate it. That's another three thousand dollars. 
And so you kind of go on like that with each of these pieces, and at the end you come up with almost thirty thousand dollars. So it's a really good thing when we get them back. <laughs> and it's a really bad thing. Uh, we don't lose very many. Uh, and so we use these to especially explore some of the threats to large whales, you know, ship strikes, entanglements, underwater sound, and you know, increasingly we're concerned about changing ocean conditions. You know, ship strikes have been a concern, especially here in the Santa Barbara Channel, where we have some of the busiest shipping lanes, uh, you know, anywhere in the world, and the busiest that we have on the U.S. West Coast. We're you know frequently seeing whales that have been struck by ships. So one of the key points I try to make is that ship strikes that are documented, where a whale either comes in wrapped around the bow of a ship, or the whale is found dead, represent a tiny proportion of the true mortality. Uh, we estimate that probably only 5% or less of the whales that die do we ever, ever get documented. So in 2007, when we had four blue whales wash up, struck by ships mm -hmm. in the fall of 2007, that's when you know, a lot of us became alerted to this as a critical issue. Uh, because that could have represented easily 20 times that many actually being struck by ships. Uh, you know, these are just, you know, a few photographs I've taken, you know, it makes perfect sense. You have blue whales often feeding. This here is off LA Long Beach, uh, where you'll often get blue whales feeding right in the main path where ships are coming in. Uh, this is in the Santa Barbara Channel, an area where blue whales are often feeding just south of the shipping lanes. Uh, this, I believe, is up in the Gulf of the Farallones here. So uh, these occur in a variety of areas, and sometimes we witness these very close calls, even when some of these animals were tracking. This was a case where we were tracking a blue whale that we deployed a tag on, this blue whale here. Uh, it was just off the LA Long Beach Peninsula. Uh, and what's kind of wild, it's a whale that had an interesting history. It was a whale we had first identified in the Gulf of the Farallones in 1987. Uh, we had many sightings of it along the California coast. It was one of two whales involved in overturning uh, a boat off San Diego in July 2014. Some of you might remember that because they actually got video footage of it. Uh, it was two whale watchers out in a small boat and they had a GoPro filming with this blue whale. And I think they probably, uh, you know, got either intentionally or inadvertently very close to a surface patch of krill because they were overturned by a whale that was actually doing the lunch feed right in the <laughs> So anyway, that was in July 2014, and we didn't know it at the time, but we put a tag on that whale just later that year, on 13 September. We put a tag on this whale here as it swam around uh, the LA Long Beach Peninsula. And then we ended up watching this ship that was headed to Hawaii uh, pretty much run over the top of this whale. Uh, and fortunately, what in all our earlier research, our key finding was that blue whales very rarely took any kind of evasive action. We had a number of cases where we had ships come within just 100 yards of a whale, and we were not seeing any change in directionality of the whale. But in this case, we did see a reaction by the whale. That's probably what saved it from being struck. This is the dive record of the whale. So it was at the surface here, it dove down, and then it was coming to the surface, and right here is where the ship came over the top, and you'll see it did this little U-turn, and turned around and did not come to the surface, and dove back down to about 100 meters, and then waited to come to the surface till the ship had come off. So it did demonstrate that in a few cases, and fortunately this was a ship that was moving slower, the whale was able to dive you know, and avoid surfacing. Uh, but this occurred at a distance that we estimated was on the order of 50 yards or less. Uh, we actually had trouble measuring exactly how accurate because even like the ship's position you get from an AIS, a, a reporter that's on the ship, but like these ships are several hundred, 300 yards long, so uh, where was that AIS reporter on the ship? All of that mattered in trying to precisely measure how close this whale got to the ship, but we think it was about 50 to 80 meters that it got, and it just barely avoided being hit. 
Now these whales, uh, the most dramatic case was a tag we deployed in 2016 off the Gulf of the Farallons, and that's an area that is right at the exit to San Francisco Bay, and there are three sets of shipping lanes that come out. And this whale ended up spending large amounts of time feeding in every one of the shipping routes that ships use to come and go from that area. And then we could use acoustics on this tag to see how many times did a ship come so close. Normally you can't hear a ship from a tag on a whale because there's all this water flowing by the tag and it creates this kind of sound that masks the sound of the ships. But despite that masking effect, this is a close approach of a ship right here. And basically we documented that there were 14 close ship approaches that we estimate were 100 yards or less from this whale just in uh, the 10 day period that we had this tag on this whale. So you can see how they would be at risk from those kinds of situations. Uh, we published a paper last year uh, looking at where blue humpback and fin whales were most vulnerable to ship strikes. And in red shows the areas that they were most vulnerable. And this is blue whales, this is humpbacks, this is fin whales. And the main thing I want to draw your attention to is all the red here in Southern California. So right in the area we are, from estimating both the amount of ship traffic and the distribution of whales, we were able to show where were blue whales most at risk. Uh, and it's right here off Southern California. And the ship routes that they take out of LA Long Beach goes to the south, west, and up here through the Santa Barbara Channel. Uh, there's also this high area of vulnerability right off the Farallones as well. For humpback whales, it's somewhat similar, but a little more skewed up here to up off San Francisco and a little less aimed uh, right here in Southern California. And for fin whales, they're mostly affected by these along the coast routes that these ships take. This long streak of red going along here shows these ships transiting, especially between the LA Long Beach um, and San Francisco, uh, create this corridor that they pass through ideal fin whale habitat. So anyway, with this study, we were able to estimate what are the areas most at risk. We also were able to estimate just with some models of avoidance behavior by whales, how likely was a whale to be struck by a ship. And no one had tried to calculate that in a kind of mathematical, spatial model way. And it basically showed that it, would, it came out with results that were very consistent with uh, the fact that only about 5 to 10 percent of ship strikes are documented. It came out with numbers that show that it is quite a few animals that are being struck and killed by ships. And our estimated mortality for, uh, by year was in the neighborhood of 20 per year for blue whales, pretty close to 20 per year for humpback whales, uh, and closer to 40 per year for fin whales. So it was the first way we had found to try to actually estimate how many ship strikes are likely to come. Okay, I'm going to show you just a few tag data. Uh, let's see, I'm about 45 minutes in, so I'm going to actually try to wrap this up uh, pretty quick and show a few videos at the end. Uh, so I, I, won't, I won't talk past uh, 8 o'clock. Uh, but this is showing you some of the kind of data we get. So one of the things I mentioned we were really interested in is calling behavior of blue whales. When do they vocalize? And this is a figure generated by a graduate student that works with us named James Balbush. Uh, and, and he's gone through this uh, deployment from last year on a blue whale. And these are the dives of a blue whale. Uh, and each black section you see here is nighttime, and each light section is a day. So you can see this represents about two weeks uh, of dive behavior by a blue whale with day night. And one thing I'll point out first of all is you see very dramatically that blue whales are diving deeper in the day. That's why these gray lines come down to here. And look at how shallow they're diving at night. So at night they're staying very shallow. In the day they're diving deeper. <coughs> the red dots show when was there a lunge. We, he used the accelerometer on the tag to detect when were blue whales opening their mouths. And, and when they do that, it brings them this sudden deceleration. So we could use that deceleration to look at every feeding event by a blue whale. I think there are something like 6,000 red dots here that he went through just on this one tag. 
And you can see there's a couple of interesting things. The blue whales are primarily feeding down at depth. Their feeding becomes shallower as it gets near evening and the krill layer moves closer to the surface. And then you'll see very few red dots at night. And that kind of matched what we thought. But then he was excited to note there were a few nights, like right here, and right here, and right here, where blue whales did in fact feed at night near the surface. And that's why these red dots are, these red dots are lined up both with time, but also with depth. Uh, and so you can see, uh, it gave us a new insight into blue whales, that uh, we knew they primarily fed in the day, we knew they spent more time near the surface at night. But now this was starting to show us that uh, in some nighttime events, and these were primarily periods where there were pretty full moons, so we're a little suspicious of that be altering the krill behavior. Or is the blue whale using a visual cue that it can get? Uh, so we're going to try to get this kind of data from all of the tags we deploy, mix it with data on things like cloud cover and moon, and try to figure out, is there any pattern we can come up with of why they're sometimes able to feed at night? You know, one of the things that was puzzling to us is you would expect when krill is near the surface, that's when it's easiest for the blue whales to get to it and feed. So they should be feeding a bunch at night, but really what matters to a blue whale isn't how easy it is to get to. For a blue whale, it's how densely packed the krill is. Because these animals go through all of this energy. They have to accelerate, and then they open their mouths, and it's like a giant parachute that opens their throat to engulf this huge volume of water. And it brings them to a standstill, and then they have to re-accelerate each time, so it's very energetically costly. And whether that's beneficial or not, at a certain density of krill, you're expending more energy than you're getting from the krill you're eating. Uh, but when the krill density is high, and this uh, colleague of mine at Stanford, Jeremy Bullbogen, who we've worked with a number of years, and he's an author on many of our publications, uh, has looked at the energetics, and it can go from you know negative energy feeding on krill when density is low, to what he says is one of the most efficient, cost-effective, energy-effective feeding mechanism of any animal. If the krill density is high, the animal has this potential for this one engulfment to engulf this huge amount of prey in this giant throat uh, pouch that it has. So we're excited about this kind of data that we're getting on day and night. I will point out that we also get very precise data on the movements of whales. So here's the Santa Barbara Channel. Uh, and this is, again, a deployment from last year on a blue whale. In white are the positions during the day, and in black are the positions during the night. And I'll just draw your attention to a couple of things, that there are a number of these loops going out that you'll see here and here and even here, that shows that, and those are those nights when the blue whales were not feeding, uh, when these animals make these meandering courses. Uh, and it turns out not only are they spending more time in shallow water at night, uh, nearer the surface, more vulnerable to ship strikes, but they're also occurring in different areas. And the shipping lanes kind of come through this area on an angle about like this. And you can see, especially like this loop and this loop, you might think, well, the blue whales are feeding down here, that'll keep them out of the shipping lane. But especially these meandering routes they do at night, will actually take them into the shipping lanes right when they're spending the most time at the surface. And just to give you a, kind of a, a quick picture, oh, is this going to work? Yeah, there we are. This is just showing a day. You can see the screen is getting lighter. This is daytime. This is the movements of a blue whale plotting these positions, showing its movement along the shelf edge. Here it's becoming nighttime. Again, you can see it just moves along the edge of the shelf, looking for areas to feed. And wandering. So that's just a little bit of a kind of an animation of some of that movement pattern that we were just looking at. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, 10 of. Uh, I mentioned the increase in entanglement rates we've been having on humpback whales. So this is a figure of how many whales were confirmed to be entangled in different types of fishing gear by year. And you can see the numbers were pretty low, generally under 10 a year through the 2000s. But starting in 2015, it jumped up here to almost 50 a year for entanglements uh, along the U.S. West Coast. And it's 
it dropped a little bit in 2017, but it was still really hot. Uh, in terms of the species involved, in blue here are humpback whales, and that's what's dominated this increase. Uh, a number of other species are involved, including gray whales and blue whales, but humpback whales have been the majority, especially of this increase in recent years. Uh, and, uh, you know, so that's been, you know, a great concern. While not all of the fishing gear is identified, the, the main fishing gear that seems to be involved is Dungeons Carp uh, fishery, a fishery that occurs all along the West Coast. It's primarily a winter fishery, <coughs> winter and spring, but it extends into the summer. Uh, and we think there's some ways that uh, in recent years with more humpback whales, with humpback whales spreading their distribution into more areas, and also I think with there being more food pressure, they're arriving earlier and creating a greater overlap with that Dungeness crab fishery that is most active in winter and spring. So we think that's part of the reason for this increase. Uh, you know, there's some good news that Dungeness crab fishermen in all three states, California, Oregon, and Washington, have started meeting, uh, working with NOAA. I've presented to each of those three states groups. They're trying to identify what things can they do, what gear changes can they make, can they reduce the amount of extra line that they have in the water. Uh, so there are measures they're exploring to try to find ways to reduce this mortality. Ultimately, I, you know, I, to me, I'm sort of tempted by just the fact that if they ended the fishery earlier, it would overlap less. That there, there seems to be one solution that could be implemented, but that's a pretty painful solution because especially some of the, the fishermen that operate smaller boats are the ones that are more reliant on fishing into the summer. So that could have a pretty big impact on some fishermen. Uh, but that would be one way to try to reduce it. But that's kind of one you know, area of concern. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna just go a little faster here just to cover a few things. Uh, I wanted to mention just a, a tiny bit on our fin whale deployments. I mentioned I'd come back to fin whales. These are the deployments and the movements of fin whales from tags we deployed this year. Uh, and I was down here both in May and then again in mid to late June. Uh, and we deployed a couple of tags, both here down off LA Long Beach in Santa Monica Bay, uh, and then two tags here in the Santa Barbara Channel. And they got some interesting data. Some of these fin whales were staying in the same area. These are color-coded by individual. Uh, but others made some big movements. This animal was feeding here off LA Long Beach over towards Catalina, but then it came and fed here north of Santa Barbara Island and also came up here just at the eastern end of the Santa Barbara Channel. Uh, and, and we were able to get the same kind of dive data. You know, this is again dive records on a fin whale over time. Day, night, day, night, day. You'll see they have some of that same pattern that blue whales have of feeding deeper in the day and shallower at night. Okay. I'm just going to maybe show, uh, I mentioned we've been doing a bunch of work with gray whales. So one of the things we've been doing, we have a local population of gray whales that comes in and feeds in Puget Sound. Uh, we have some of the same individuals we've been tracking now for over 25 years. Like this individual here, we first identified in 1991 and we've seen them virtually every year since. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the interesting things is they feed in really shallow water uh, in the intertidal zone. And we, this is actually a Google Earth view. And if you blow up Google Earth at low tide, uh, up here off the Snohomish River Delta, you'll see all these little tiny pock marks. Those are feeding pits created by a gray whale. Feeding, just by blowing up the Google Earth image. And this is a map that all these little white dots are where we've marked a known location of a gray whale feeding pit. Uh, and one of my colleagues at Cascadia has been documenting this. I think at last count he was up to something like 17,000 of these feeding pits he's been able to document going through these kind of records. Uh, we were trying to figure out how these whales were feeding, so we deployed these video tags. Uh, you know, just to show you a little bit of, you know, Data. This is the kind of data we get from some of these suction cup attached video tags. This is a dual view with the camera facing forward here and backwards. And we had a kind of unfortunate surprise here where 
we deployed this tag and then within about five minutes another gray whale came along and turned the tag around. So now instead of facing forward, the tag is facing backwards. So it's giving us a backwards view. Which, you know, turned out to be kind of interesting too because it ended up showing that this particular individual, which was a female we've been tracking again for over 25 years, was being followed by these three males that have come into view. Uh, this is some of the data we're getting off the tag and it's actually tracking along with the video showing how deep the whale is, uh, the accelerometry signal, whether it's rolling on its side, it shows different behavior. So here's one whale following it right here. So this is a female that the tag is on and these three whales following it are all males. Uh, and you'll see there's one right here, another will come into view right here, and then a third one to the left uh, here. They're all just following after this female as she comes into shallow water uh, to feed. So we think it might have been this individual that kind of p pioneered this very shallow intertidal feeding. And some of these other whales were able to follow and learn where to feed from her because they followed her into the shallow water areas to feed. Uh, anyway, let's see. Uh, uh, I was going to point out that in addition to uh, sometimes uh, hurting us with how they change the tag, here's a tag. This time the tag is facing backwards and it's kind of shaking, which means it's about to fall off. And here's a, a following animal right here. And, you know, to me it's kind of fascinating. Here's another. So here's two whales rubbing up against this whale. And, you know, the social lives of these whales is very different than I expected. You kind of, how much they interacted underwater. Now, these whales are just kind of rubbing up against each other, bumping each other. And these are whales that have been together for some 20, 25 years they've come to this area. So they know each other pretty well. And then right here, this time, this whale rubs up against the tag. And now the tag is facing perfectly forward. So uh, this deployment ended up you know, giving us a record deployment of 67 hours that this tag came on, stayed on, partly because these whales kept pressing it back on. <laughs> and now this, you know, this tag is now facing, you can see there's the head of the whale, the blowhole is positioned exactly how we wanted it. So it actually turned out to, uh, to be really useful. Uh, and that helped us out because now we could actually document the gray whales feeding in this shallow water. So here's a whale going down, almost immediately it's at the bottom. Here it is. This is the bottom, and all of these are little ghost shrimp feeding holes. And the whale is putting it the side of its head, right side of its head, up against the bottom, and then actually starting to suck in that sediment and feeding on the ghost shrimp. Uh, and that's what it does. I'll show you just another uh, view of that here. Uh, here, that you can see what that looks like. So here it rolls on its side. It's immediately on the bottom, because this is only in about 10 feet of water. <laughs> And now its head is against, you can see it's not moving, its head is against the bottom. Uh, and pretty soon it'll start actually using its tongue to suck in the sediment. And you'll see these clouds of uh, sediment here start to come up as it filters through uh, the different organisms. So right here you'll see, now you'll see all these clouds coming by. There'll actually be a ghost shrimp that will go by here. We have a group of uh, managers, scientists, and government representatives that worked. Uh, and the Channel Island Sanctuary has been working really hard on this issue to find ways to reduce ship strikes. Uh, and some progress was made a number of years ago when the, ship, the southbound shipping lane got actually moved a mile north, which is pretty small, but we estimated that could reduce the threat to whales about 15%, not huge, but a small change. But one of the things we ran into is that some of the areas that it would be ideal to move the shipping lanes into like to have, the, instead of going through the Santa Barbara Channel, go south of the northern Channel Islands, ran into opposition from the Navy. The Navy, because they use those areas as a training range. And even though ships still go through those areas, they didn't want to do anything that would increase the number of ships moving there. And if there's one action I think we could do, it would be trying to put pressure, and this is not the best political climate, to achieve that. So we don't have a lot of hope for that at the moment. Uh, but, you know, somehow, especially if there are another series of incidents that bring this to greater 
you know, public and political attention, it would be trying to shape the Navy of that, you know, willingness to allow shipping lanes to go through some of these lower density areas. I see someone approaching. One more question? One more. One more question. Okay. How about right here? As the population grows with these migration and the migration grows, how are you going to share again with the Navy and all these other areas? How are you going to do that with the population yeah, and their feeding areas expanding? No, it There's not more, enough fish. Yeah. It becomes more challenging uh, for sure. I mean, the, the neat thing for me is there is good news. When you look at humpback whales, we've seen this impressive recovery from whaling. You know, so that's really encouraging. Uh, you know, we are facing these other challenges, partly caused by that, but also partly caused by you know the increasing levels of human activities we have in some of these areas. Uh, you know, I think we have to keep trying to find the areas of progress that can we can make, like the pingers on the fishing nets. Uh, like trying to shift shipping lanes away from areas of concentration and find the best ways we can to minimize them. You know, fortunately, right now, I don't think any of those threats are threatening the population. You know, having 20, 30 whales, you know, blue whales a year being killed by ships, we don't want that. Uh, but at least right now, we do have this healthy population that's growing here. And more and more people are seeing, I mean, this area here, we're seeing there's tremendous economic benefits, livelihood benefits from whale watching and other activities, you know, that also give it a little economic impact as well, which is important. I will mention our website, CascadiaResearch.org. Uh, you can get a hold of our publications that way. Uh, they're a little drier than what I presented tonight, but that's our, our, our main goal. Uh, you can find a link. I didn't show many of the videos we have of blue whales and humpback whales feeding underwater. There's some really dramatic stuff we get. But there's a link on our website to a YouTube channel that has small clips of those videos so you can see some of those. Or if you're an educator and want to show them in your class, you can access them that way. So again, that's at CascadiaResearch.org. Great. Thank you very much. Yes. Come up and ask me questions. I will stay around. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes.